That works. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Kirsha Krugloff. I work for Mozilla um, as an engineer. And I'm here as a poor conduit for uh, Emily's slides. Uh, she couldn't make it at the last moment. So I'm here to talk about Project uh, Mentat, which is um, an embedded Rust store um, that um, we're using at Mozilla to solve some of our problems. And I'll talk about what those problems are, how we're trying to solve them, and um, a, bit, a, a bit about the, the team that's uh, uh, working on Mentat. So um, we're part of the browser architecture user data team, um, and that's um, Emily Tupnik, Alexander, myself, and in the past, Richard Newman, um, who's with us in spirit and in the front row. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and so the team's, team's goals are to um, kind of uh, figure out what, what changes we need to make now to solve our three to five year uh, goals. And for Mozilla and for Firefox, those are expanding Firefox. Um, and uh, well, so like making the Firefox better, creating user experiences, and also going beyond Firefox, building new applications to solve uh, particular user needs. And a lot of the stuff, like there's a lot of hurdles uh, involved, but uh, one of the big things uh, is uh, user data, right? It's like, a, like a, that's our big moat essentially, is we have a lot of valuable data and people would like to access it in different uh, types of applications and our apps will like to use them. And currently, uh, that's problematic. Um, we have, uh, for, for a variety of reasons that I'll uh, kind of go, go through. Um, so part of the, so one of the problems is storing, storing the data. So we store, like, something like a browser stores a lot of, uh, you'll, you'll be surprised how many different things it stores. Uh, some of it about, is about user behavior, some of, it is, some of it is about just like internals of the browser, and a lot of it, um, and so there are a lot of different teams uh, involved in, in storing this stuff. Uh, in, and the teams make their own decisions about data storage layers. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, those decisions are driven more by immediate needs. Like, how do we make this thing work for this UI? How do we make it, um, how do we query it quickly? Um, you know, how do we ship it tomorrow, um, et cetera, et cetera. Right, and so, and then since a lot of different teams may, are making the decisions, uh, they're not necessarily, um, well, so they're making the, the decisions, the, and the outcomes uh, vary uh, uh, since you just have a lot of uh, people and not everyone talks to each other. And like there's, a, some of it is shared expertise, but some of it is sort of like folk knowledge. Um, and teams might not be thinking about needs beyond their immediate needs. So like if, if today and like in a month, you don't need to share some data in between different clients, you might not like bake that into your initial data schema. And then you'll realize that to, like when you will need that eventually, it's gonna be problematic to evolve. Um, right, and so um, uh, the decisions that people end up making around data storage needs, uh, well, they, often they start off as like, well, let's just use something simple, maybe like a JSON store or something. And, um, and that, that doesn't tend to scale all that well, right? It might solve your really immediate needs, but it doesn't necessarily solve future needs. And, you know, uh, like building uh, fast, concurrent, safe access to a JSON store uh, that will, you know, like happen across many different components is, is gonna be troublesome and you're gonna end up um, essentially solving a lot of hard problems many, many times because you have many different data stores. Um, and, um, and then if you do pick like a more comprehensive solution to begin with, um, you'll, uh, well, um, you will, uh, sorry, <laughs> I don't know my, don't know my uh, slides here, but you'll, uh, you'll end up with like, uh, with a lot of, with a host of other problems, right? So like if you, if you, um, uh, so for example, like if you picked a SQLite store, um, as your uh, storage model, you'll uh, still need to handle a lot of migrations and as your project evolves, as your data needs evolve, uh, that tends to become quite problematic as well. Uh, and people don't necessarily think about, uh, think in the correct ways about those problems because it's, it's, it's a fairly specialized skill doing this stuff, like building data stores that will sync and that will evolve well over time. Um, and another, so that kind of ties into the second point is sharing the data. 
Um, and by sharing, we mean sharing amongst, well, like in, in, Fire, in Firefox, we mean specifically sharing across different instances of Firefox or in the future uh, between different products that use Firefox data. Um, so we have strong privacy uh, guarantees and that part of, the, like a big part of that is end-to-end -end encryption, uh, which means that uh, clients uh, have to uh, do all of the conflict resolution work. Uh, server cannot be there to, like server is just a dump, a blob store, more or less. Um, and we have mo multiple clients and uh, the set of clients is growing uh, and we'd like it to grow, right? That's part of our three to five year goals is that, you know, building more products that use this data. Um, right, and then each client is, uh, well, they have their own data storage implementations they are written in different languages. We have JavaScript, Java, Swift, et cetera, implementations. Um, and yeah, and, and, and the clients tend to uh, build data, like the, the teams that are building this stuff, they tend to build data um, that's um, oriented around their immediate needs, so like querying the stuff, like which isn't, and the, the, the schemas you'll, uh, you'll pick for that are not necessarily the schemas you'll pick if you want to optimize, to optimize for syncing. Um, and so you, you run into problems like you can't do three-way merges of data because you don't have historical view into how some uh, tables changed. Um, and yeah, so well, here, so let's, let's, I guess let's try to look at a concrete example um, uh, of what that actually looks like in practice. Like here's a simple, like a really simplistic way to model a password storage layer. So like you have two clients, we have a server in the middle, which it just acts as a dumb blob. And the schema is very basic. You have, there's a URL for that URL, we have username and password and, and there's a timestamp. Um, so uh, there are some immediate problems as you start making changes here. So uh, say imagine client one makes a change to a URL. Uh, maybe they've observed now that, uh, oh, I think there's a change. Uh, so they've observed that the URL changed and they record when that the change happened. And client two makes a change to the password. So you'll see the password is now different. And um, here's an animation. Uh, there you go, yeah. So like client one syncs, the data is now on the server and um, client two will sync eventually and the data will now slowly, yeah, you'll notice that like we essentially get a blob, JSON blob back, right? And now at this point we have to make a decision. Uh, like we, we have two JSON blobs we, and we have to somehow smoosh them together, right? We, we see that the URL changed, the password changed and this information is on the server already, so other clients might have seen it. So we don't have a ton of choice here. We have to take what we see, uh, which is usually what happens in, in, in like simplistic kind of syncing scheme uh, flows like this, right? And so we end up on the client two. We've just lost the password. Um, so like this is a lossy process. We lost the password changed, and we end up like with a state that we've never really observed, and client two has really no way to recover from this. Um, and so there are ways to s kind of fix that problem in an existing world, but they tend to involve a lot of, uh, a lot of work essentially, right? Like because we could uh, track more state on each client. Uh, but as I mentioned, we have many clients and they all have different implementations of stores and it involves writing a lot of complicated code many times in different languages and trying to coordinate across teams to do that. Uh, but there's this concept called, um, so like, but like one of the lessons uh, that uh, we, oh, that people tend to learn uh, as they write this stuff is uh, it's, it, it helps to separate the way you query stuff from the way you uh, modify uh, your data, right? And that's, uh, there's this idea of CQRS that you essentially segregate, uh, se separate query uh, from command, right? So like you separate the way you modify data from uh, you, the way you query it and that lets you address individual like needs specific to each side of that equation in, in, in a more coherent way and be very explicit about that separation. So for example, we'd like fast querying, but we'll also like data uh, that is syncable. And those two are kind of at odds with each other. Um, and this kind of approach, making this explicit, lets us actually address, the, like make some progress with the, pro uh, with the, with the problem. And so, uh, yeah, so we get to trying to, like, so, so, and so we get to trying to build Mentat and fix those problems that we've observed. 
Um, and um, we, the teams made, um, they went through kind of this regular uh, buyer build this, uh, decision. Like we're like, we're looking for something that solves uh, the problems. Uh, like maybe has a, maybe is shaped in a CQRS style. Maybe is event or like log shaped. Um, has allows us to define strong schemas uh, explicitly uh, because we, that really helps with syncing data. And there's always a scheme in your data, even if it's implicit, except you're just gonna, like it's just a foot gun waiting to fire if it's not explicit. Um, and yeah, and then so we went through like this uh, you know, kind of a set of regular um, suspects. Um, and like the, the point is that something, like we always have run into missing features, right? Like it's not embeddable or it doesn't have full text indexing or we can't, uh, you know, use it on many different platforms with a single implementation. And so ideologically, um, in the, uh, we've kind of came across the Atomic, which is um, a database that exists in the closure world. Um, and it's transactional. It has humane data models in the sense that um, they're, like they're, well, we have a strongly typed schema with that, and we can mutate it over time easily. We have transaction, we have a log of everything that happens. We have a rich querying via the data log, which is their querying language. But uh, yeah, it's only, but only in the spirit is it like a good, a good fit because it's, it, well, it's actually is a server side uh, kind of a system. It's not open source. Um, and yeah, then we get to data script, which exists in the same similar mind share. Um, it's a closure script implementation of those ideas, of the Atomic's ideas, but again, it well, requires a JavaScript runtime. So not really something we can um, necessarily deploy for real in, in, in the environments we care about. And it exists in memory only and we really care about persistence of data. And so we get to build your own. Um, and so like the, which is what the rest of this kind of talk covers. And um, the basic co concept is for now anyway, is to use something like SQLite or specifically SQLite underneath to store the data. Because you get everything from SQLite, like it's a solid project. Uh, you have a, re it's a reliable relational store with FTS capable, um, small memory footprint, et cetera, et cetera. There's a long history behind it. Um, and then we'll start layering kind of uh, the ideas we care about on top of SQLite. So we'll layer a transaction log on top, we'll have a uh, mutable strongly typed schema and we have querying it um, and and that implies that we'll need to trans uh, kind of compile our querying query language or like data log in this case into SQL in the end um, and so one of the first kind of prototypes and stops of this is uh, was written in closure script uh, because at the time we we're uh, prototyping a browser written in JavaScript and this like this was a good prototyping decision uh, we ran into a bunch of problems um, buggy async channels, et cetera. Like the transpiling process was slow and buggy. Uh, and uh, it's just, and it, again, like this required a JavaScript runtime, which uh, like is a, is a hard requirement if you're trying to embed this across and use this across like iOS, Android applications and also in desktop, et cetera. Um, and so uh, we, yeah, so like Rust is a natural next Kind of a choice. Like the the only real alternative to this is C plus um, plus, but um, but like we get a lot of benefits from Rust, right? Like it's a modern, uh, real expressive language with really uh, nice algebraic algebraic data types that really kind of help manage complexity of something like this. Um, it's and we get predictable, correct results once we sort of work through all of the problems, right? Um, and we, it's performant, right? So like there, it's not all uh, kind of roses. It's uh, the implementation took much longer to write than something done the initial prototype in closure script. And it's still a kind of an ongoing thing. Um, but we, like we get, like we, we, we get a lot of things out of it, right? That the, in the trifecta that Mentat cares, uh, like Rust trifecta Mentat cares about this kind of correctness combined with portability. Um, so cross platform. Um, combined with performance. Um, so those are the things that really make a difference here. So, and if we kind of peek under the hood of Mentat, um, it's, it's essentially, so like the, the core is the transaction log. And this isn't quite what, like if you, op if you were to open up a Mentat SQLite database, isn't, this isn't an exact representation, but it's close enough. 
Um, it's a quad, well, it's a tuple store. Um, we have everything is an entity in the system, including your schema definitions. Um, and entities are described by attributes, which, and then like the, the, the two have a value, right? So like a URL, so like a login URL will be an attribute of some entity and there'll be a value of like rustconf.com. And um, those, everything is grouped by transactions because we want atomic applications of data. We kind of want to track when things happen and how. Um, and uh, since it's a log and it's an append only kind of a log, we need to know uh, if we're adding or retracting a piece of data. So changing a URL will actually involve retracting the existing uh, URL and then appending a new one. And so that's what this looks like, on, like, like under the hood. Um, and so the, the, the thing that's missing here is that, you know, the values can be typed and we have uh, a bunch of different types we support and, uh, you know, the, we, we can enforce that at schema level. Um, and then Mentat will complain if you're trying to write wrong types into data. Um, yeah, and so, and let's try to, and like this is an example of what, uh, uh, the transaction table, how, how data flows around, right? The, what it actually looks like for real. Um, so for example, like it's also simplistic, but it's, I think it illustrates the problem well enough. So we, we have the same citation as before. We have client one, two, uh, blob. Um, the server is still like a dumb server blob. Everything is still end-to-end -end encrypted. And except now we have those transaction logs. And so let's try start making changes, right? So like me, changing a password in client two, we're missing some records, but this is good enough, uh, is, is essentially involves appending a new password to the log. Uh, and you'll notice that it's, now it's in a different transaction. Um, and let's make a similar change in, on client one. We'll append a new, uh, new URL. And there you go, now we're syncing stuff. We append, like, so a log, a server essentially has like an encrypted log uh, which to, into which we appended uh, new records. And so let's, when we sync those records back, uh, we now have, like, you'll notice that we have conflicting IDs. Um, so, well, it's almost an implementational detail since we chose um, integer, um, you know, like, like transactions are represented as an integer, but like we perform something akin to a git rebase where you play back, well, like you rewind your current state back to a shared parent, you play in remote changes, um, and then you play your local changes on top. And like that's one, one way to do this. Uh, you could also represent this as a merge or um, depending on your needs or like the schema, might, different things might make sense. Um, but like if you were just to do a simple rebase, uh, well, you end up with this nice linear log where you have a, like an exact record of everything that happened in the system. You have the old password, the new password, the URLs, everything. And then we sync back um, the log back to the first client. There you go. Um, and so now both clients, they agree on the, on the log. They have a coherent view into the system. And uh, they have a nicely, like they have a nice historic view of everything that happened. And so like your conflict resolution algorithms, um, like specific to the domain, to the data models can make the right decisions, uh, which is nice. Um, so that's kind of the flow, right? And then, and then, the, we, then we get back to uh, kind of querying this data. So like we talked about CQRS, um, and how it's important to kind of think about that separation of how you store data um, and, and how you modify the data and then how you read it back, right? And then th those two are quite different. Like if, if you were to read the transaction log all the way from the beginning, it's, uh, it will be a terrible experience uh, uh, performance-wise since you have to actually, so, like, so we do that for you. Like we call that the datums table. Uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's essentially a materialized view into the transaction log. It's a snapshot of the transaction log as, a, as it is, uh, as of the last transaction. And so, so you notice it's missing the added field. So it's, well, it's not, it's just a snapshot. The, this is what it is now. So it's, and Mentad internally keeps modifying this uh, materialization as the data changes. Um, and uh, yeah, and then, so you'll notice that uh, 
So this is what the data table will look like. And you'll notice that the attribute is now expanded. Like it's actually, attributes are also part of the schema and they, they, they're just another entity. In the system, you have entities describing entities. It's kind of like an RDF like uh, approach. Um, and yeah, and then like when we're querying this stuff, we expand out into like from the keywords, like login URL into like an actual entity. And the, the datum table will contain that. And when, but when you're querying this uh, data, you don't have to worry about stuff like this. You can, uh, you describe the attributes you'd like. Um, and this is like a, a simple example of a data lock query that you would use to query this stuff. You describe what you would like and you uh, uh, define your bindings, like URL, username, password will be bound to login slash URL, etc. And you get back, and then internally, Mantat will compile this down into a bunch of SQL. And you'll notice that it's, it's like a self joins the datums on a datums table. So we're querying, we're not querying the transaction log, we're querying this uh, internal materialized view of it. Um, it's a bit quicker. It's not, uh, like it's still pretty slow, uh, or s slow enough, um, but it's, yeah, but like it's, that's how it would sort of look like internally, right? So like you go from, from, from this into, into this. And you'll notice that like we're not doing anything really tricky here. Like we have resolved the attributes into their ant IDs and we're joining on ant IDs so to ensure we get the correct view of the data for each entity. Um, yeah, and then you get back a bunch of results and this is missing the ant ID column, but you get back data from, from the system. And, and then you do this at infinite. Uh, like the, the datums table is just a simple, it's, a, it's an internal materialized view. It's one materialized view in the system, but like the CQRS lesson is, the, is that applications are usually well served by many, many different views that define, uh, that like represent the data that the UIs or whatever else would like to query in, in, in your data store. So you have a really normalized data store and you have denormalized views into that data store. Uh, and so we have, um, or we will have anyway, is um, a user defined materialized views where you define, like say you might, like if you're in a browsing situation, you might only care about the top 10 uh, visited websites and your history might have tens of thousands of records, but you only care about the 10 of them and you only want your view, and when you're querying your view, you, like it'll be really quick, it'll just have 10 records and maybe, maybe like five, 10 columns or something. Um, so the querying will be really quick and internally Mentat will use transaction listeners to monitor changes to, the, um, uh, to its log and update the views you've defined, um, which is nice. And like it's the same mechanism that it uses internally for its datums table, for its datums view. Um, and then you can define as many of those views as you'd like as your application uh, requires and there will be very domain specific for you. Um, and that's your kind of way to query data and, but you're still, when you're writing data, you're not touching your, your views obviously, you're still writing into the transaction log. Um, so, right, so like, that's sort of like a peek into Mentat internals. And um, it's the, the, the part, like, it was really important that whatever we build will work in every environment that we need. And uh, those environments uh, involve many different mobile platforms. Um, well, two mobile platforms. It's one too many. Um, it's, um, and as well as Firefox desktop itself uh, and maybe other consumers in the future. And so we have a public API which is wrapped in a FFI layer which lets you access it from, well, from non-Rust uh, code. And we build an iOS uh, SDK in Swift and an Android SDK in Java. They're, they're shallow SDKs. Um, they're, they map pretty well to Mentat's internals. And, and they essentially let you use this stuff without having to worry about FFI and any of this stuff. Uh, just, just as if you're writing uh, like a nice native Java application, uh, you can, query and write data and you can define materialized use things and uh, you can you know, invoke syncing um, and integrate with whatever is appropriate to your environment um, for scheduling stuff like this. And soon we'll have SDKs in Kotlin because um, that's like the hot new thing apparently. And, um, and XPCOM stuff for, um, for well, integration into Firefox proper. Because um, the plan uh, is to 
well, so right now we're, we're still solving some of the hard problems. Um, so syncing is a work in progress. So we're still working on the various merging algorithms. Um, we're working on uh, forgetting um, data, which is important from like both, both privacy concerns, uh, like the right to forget, and just the you know, ability for people to erase history from their log that they don't like, as well as just from engineering uh, perspective. Like you have an infinite log in a really finite universe and it's just not gonna work forever. Um, and yeah, we're still evolving our API a little bit as we're building our internal consumers that's shaping the API and writing the documentation. And um, the next step is uh, shipping this uh, in uh, Firefox Logbox, which is a, a standalone uh, password manager that Mozilla is building that gives you access to all of your Firefox account passwords. Um, and so it will be backed by Mentat and uh, eventually syncing via Mentat as well. And in the future, we have this uh, internally uh, process of building uh, Android components um, that will help us build browsers better. And we'll be wrapping Mentat into an Android component so like, it's more easily accessible um, for our internal teams and for anyone who's well, building something that looks like a browser. Uh, we'll be using it in um, new products that Mozilla are, are, is building. Um, for storing new data and interacting with the existing sync ecosystem. Uh, we'll build building new features inside the existing products, which was historically quite difficult uh, because evolving data is really difficult in the existing system. It will be much simpler in, in this new world. Um, and uh, eventually we'll start evolving the existing Firefox stores and building, we have a vague transition plan and uh, it's sort of coming to fruition with some of the efforts internally. Um, and um, the next is, well, I guess you guys, uh, like perhaps other people have uh, mentat shaped uh, problems and would love to help you address them and uh, get you involved in the development of this stuff. Um, so the links are, it's, everything is in standard places. All of the development happens with GitHub. Documentation is there. Um, there's a wiki page, has a bunch of modeling examples and a lot of, um, kind of a theory on syncing and data stores written down. Um, so please peruse that and um, yeah, and then fi find myself or other people from the teams um, um, to ask additional questions. Okay, thanks a lot.